and the county wishes to underscore the importance of local government partnering with our residents to better ensure they are prepared to protect themselves and their family in the event of an emergency. And whereas the Dallas County partners with municipalities, volunteer groups, nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, state agencies, and others to provide emergency preparedness outreach programs to better educate the public on family and disaster preparedness and Whereas Dallas County departments such as Homeland Security and Emergency Management, the County Fire Marshal, the County Health and Human Services, the Sheriff's Department, and others partner to provide essential emergency preparedness information to the public. And whereas the public has a responsibility to ensure they have a family emergency plan, complete disaster kit, and an effective family communications plan to better assist them in surviving a disaster or a significant emergency event that might occur in Dallas County. Now, therefore, be a result, the Dallas County Commission's Court is hereby acknowledged and recognized September as Dallas County Preparedness Month and encourages all residents to create an emergency plan and emergency care for their families. At this time, uh, I'll, I'll move forward towards adoption and call up uh, uh, Zach Thompson and Health and Human Services, uh, the Sheriff's Department, uh, who are here, the Fire Marshal, and Homeland Security and Emergency Management uh, representatives. We we'll all work as a as a team to uh, uh, keep us safe. Second, uh, uh, all, all, um, all those in favor. Motion uh, carries. Uh, and Robert, coming judge. Uh, I see Dr. Pepe in the back. Right? Oh, and Dr. Pepe, you know, Dr. Pepe, why don't you come forward? Oh, sure. as well, you have, you have a role in that uh, as well. Um, if there's if there's uh, other emergency management partners that, that I, I didn't call on, please come forward. And Doug, you want to uh, lead us off in, the, in a brief discussion of, of uh, the, the emergency preparedness month? Thank you, Doug, Commissioner. Uh, as we said, uh, it is an important month for family and emergency preparedness. Uh, the county partners with our municipalities, uh, the state, FEMA, of course, and others. Uh, at the national, state, and local level to uh, ensure that we're prepared. It is a partnership where we uh, work with our residents to ensure that they're prepared for the first 72 hours and that their family remains safe and that they have an emergency plan. So our partners are here this morning with us as we uh, go into preparedness month so that uh, we can make some more strides forward to make sure the public is prepared. And, uh, and yes, but let me uh, let me just tell you that this past this past week with regards to um, Hurricane Isaac and preparedness that we continue to always do in this community. Uh, one other thing, Mr. Thompson and I have done with the extraction and probably in <coughs> Katrina and in Hurricane Ida, um, we, we saw a lot of physical kind of accommodations. But one of the things that we, we figured out this time is sorely missing, it's been missing each time, is that we need, we, uh, I guess what, eight, nine years ago, we had a collaboration with Walmart with regards to what we call Operation Rescue. Uh, we assembled that, and that was designed to help individuals who had evacuated to get their mail. We do not have in place, when we talk about relocation, any opportunity to help people acquire their neighbors, even if you get the communication lines open. There's still the whole financial piece. And so I've asked Mr. Thompson, as Chairman of Public Health, to please take and try to assemble over the last three episodes how much money we've been asked to, to expend in terms of assisting people in getting their medication. They leave home, they don't have their hypertension medication, and others, et cetera. Uh, we got that call again this time, even though we said we want to show up with a pay model. Uh, first thing they call is, we do not have sufficient meds. And so uh, we, we're in the process of trying, and I guess I'm saying that to Ron, and tell them a small fund, emergency fund, that we can help. It hasn't been a lot. Now, Katrina was considerable. Uh, the last couple of one and this and I don't know what we spent this, this week is very very minimal. Yeah, it was just very small as Mr. Price pointed out North Texas Rescue back when Katrina set up the opportunity that we didn't have to put a burden on the local public hospital. That's the key aspect in terms of having the North Texas Rescue. Uh, I received a call a call from Mr. Price uh, that evening because a number of the individuals who had relocated here 
due to the uh, hurricane in uh, New Orleans. We're basically without the medication. We had two types of medication. Again, your normal uh, heart medicine, but also your psychotropic medication. And we did have, uh, since your report this morning, one who uh, had HIV, needed HIV medication. So the point is very clear. We need to establish a, a fund. This is to prevent any burdens. It's not to say that you don't have that ability at your, at your public hospital, but what we found with Katrina is that you have to have a private fund set up to be able to address that immediately as the individuals come in. That cuts down on the number of hospital runs that the ambulance has to make and, and et cetera. So we have a good plan in place to assess them at the shelter. The key is that they need medication, and so we were able to connect over the weekend uh, with uh, Walmart, got some gift cards out, and I'll get that report uh, to the court. But it's worked fluently uh, since uh, Katrina, Ike, Gustav, you name it, we've been there. Mr. Bass, I bet you didn't know when you took the job that you were going to get to perform so quickly. And uh, thank you for your performance. Thank you. We're glad you're on board. Thank you. And Fire Marshal De Los Santos, I uh, know it's an important month for your department as well, so I'd say a few words. Uh, just, the thing is, we do have a uh, burn ban in the county right now, so you know we're just trying to keep that limited to uh, any kind of burns out there. So you don't need to go sell fireworks, is that? You know, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and a, a partner that, that we have that is such a strong partner in, in these situations that we, we saw, um, particularly in the tornadoes, is the sheriff's department. Um, the sheriff's department uh, goes into these neighborhoods and these places that are affected, that are stretched to the breaking point with their own um, emergency capacity and supplements that and falls into those uh, teams seamlessly uh, and allows those humble cities to maintain control over their decisions, but um, are true partners. And without uh, the sheriff's department, uh, you know, boots on the ground, those boots, uh, Sheriff Valdez and I went together, so her boots were on the ground um, within an hour of those tornadoes hitting, um, you know, Lancaster. And, and uh, when she got there, uh, there were other deputies that were already in place, just a tremendous partner. So we've got a representative from the Sheriff's Department as well. Yes, and we will continue to support the county and all the agencies within this county on anything that they need to, have to help us with. Thank you. And don't forget also the road and bridge. Cool. Road and bridge crews. Yeah, this this county does it. You know, I can testify. You know, I haven't been the county judge to uh, two uh, declarations of emergency. Uh, these county departments really pull together. Road and bridge crews and uh, were unsung heroes in the Lancaster tornadoes. We had trees down on power lines. <coughs> But we had trees down, you know, blocking roads and, and dangerous um, you know, debris. They, they've worked on that and a host of other things. Also, an unsung hero in this latest state of emergency is uh, our public works department, who work crazy hours to get those grids. There's so much involved in shutting down airspace, flying over former presidents' houses, gridding all of those things, um, and doing it on the fly. Um, every day as, as, as the weather makes changes and, and we have to uh, draw these new maps and they were just able to, to uh, uh, do that on antiquated equipment that I'm working to get replaced with. So they were on, and there are many other, that's the thing of, of uh, recognizing our heroes is I'm going to leave some folks out, but y'all have all been you know, fantastic.
everybody. The, this is the second of two required public hearings on the Dallas County tax rate. Um, this is the 2012 or the FY 2013 tax rate. It is proposed to be 24.31 per 100 valuation or the same rate as last year. This is up ever so slightly over the effective tax rate and required, which results in about a 20 cent tax increase on the average home in Dallas County. And how do we compare um, <clears throat> with our colleagues? The last time I looked, and I haven't really been paying attention to what other counties are doing for their tax rates, we were the third lowest tax rate in the state of Texas. And are we still in the per capita debt? I think the last time I saw it, we're 150 and 4. 70 for the dollar. Even as far as debt. Yeah, debt. Yeah. Yes. Lowest debt of any county in Texas, okay. or maybe any county in the nation. But then, when you say, how much is the actual tax increase going to be for the? On the average home, it's 20 cents. 20 cents. And, and how much uh, is that over last year? It, the, it's 20 cents over the prior year, so it went from, I believe, it's approximately $137.60 from, it goes to $137.80. And it's, it's the 20 cents. Well, and, and let's be clear, it's not a tax increase at the, all. The right. That's taxes what I'm are the, the, rate is, the rate is the same, but yeah. because the effective rate is slightly less than the current rate, it does result in the average homeowner paying a little bit more in taxes. And it's slightly a misnomer in the sense of saying the average homeowner because the actual home valuations went down this year. So the homeowner will actually pay less if you looked at it that way because it was commercial value and business property that went up that resulted in the increase. But because of the way everything gets posted in the newspaper as required by state law, it shows up in the newspaper as saying the average home will have a tax rate. Right, and, and the reality is if I, if I own a warehouse that is worth a half a million dollars and suddenly it's filled with goods because the economy here is turning around and it's valued at a million dollars, <coughs> I'm paying the same rate, but since it's worth twice as much money to me, I'm going to pay more taxes. Right. Yeah. Now, what I've noticed when I look at Lancaster, DeSoto, Dallas, um, most of the cities is the, uh, the property values I've seen have either been steady or slightly down. The, the, for how for homeowners, for the, the taxpayers I'm talking about, the people that own homes, it's a good thing in my mind that tax the tax rate staying the same, and those who who uh, own commercial properties are seeing the values uh, go up. Correct. That's what we want to happen in the in recovering economy. We were also below the effective rate for the last two years. Correct. The last two years. That's why you're seeing that. Correct. Well, since it's based on commercial, if it were 40 cents, that would mean the recovery is twice as strong. So it's kind of a, we're, we're, it's a, it's a misnomer the way this is working out because the tax rate's the same, right. but the commercial values and the speculative land values have increased due to the good things that are happening here locally um, with logistics, manufacturing, and also with the part of the top tier apartment building. Anyway, you look at it, it's still a tax increase, and I'm, I'm disappointed that we couldn't have held the line because it, I think it's going to be misperceived as by the public as a tax increase. <coughs> Just make it real quick. Is it in fact a tax increase? The tax rate is not increasing. Oh. It's the same rate. Thank you. The tax increase, the, ta is, the tax is not increasing, it is the same rate. Right. It is the same rate, right. correct. Okay, so, so. I mean, if there are any other comments, I have to Is there any comments from the public? Here none, I will to close the public board. Okay, any comments? I gotta ask three times, are there any comments? Are there any comments? Are there any comments? Here, here. Hearing now, we have a motion to close. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion to close. All right. Um, Thank you. All right. Uh, now we'll consider quarters 13 through 38. We have an A1 in the next one. We have a second of public hearing. No. So we have one regarding the uh, hospital. Uh, 
Next, we have a, a, a public hearing on fiscal year 2013 tax rate for the Dallas County Hospital uh, District. Move to open the public hearing. Second. Uh, and and uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, and, and I'll ask you to take a minute, Mr. Brown. Before you do, I'll make a, a fast comment. Again, this is this is the same rate as last year. We'll talk about effective rates, and again, it will be the same. You know, the same points. If your house went down in value, you pay less taxes. If your house went up, you pay more. And the bulk of the people who are paying more are the commercial folks in warehousing and the people who own large first-year apartment complexes. So take us through that. This is the second of two required public hearings on the Dallas County Hospital District tax rate. The 2012 or FY 2013 tax rate is proposed to be 27.10 per hundred valuation, or the same rate as last year. Any 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 uh, comments from the from the uh, dais? Uh, any hearing that? Any public speakers? Any public speakers? Any public speakers? There's a motion that the public hearing cease on the 2013 Dallas County Hospital District. Five seconds. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Uh, and uh, that will take us to the motion or to the bill. So move second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, next, we get to the court orders at 10 through 38. We also have an A1 and an A2. It's in the What did I say? I said 10. I'm sorry. I'm going to put it the court orders 13 through 38, including A1 and A2. Uh, I second. Any? Uh, okay. so we have speakers on A1 and A2. Oh, I'm sorry. Do we have speakers on A1 and A2? This is the election judge list. We have Ms. Rothenberg is currently on elections for the whole government. Ms. Ms. Rodenberg, uh, please. Oh. Yeah, assuming that what you're speaking on is the election judges, the things we're voting on today, or just election judges? Not what we're voting on today. No. All right. Um, it, it's just a general, general comment. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, uh, we do have a special visitor, Ms. Cameron Curry, and then maybe some others. So. All right. In court. Would allow, would like to speak also. Yes, if there are, if there are members of the public who are here for the election, uh, Ms. Curry, please come forward. If there are any other um, <coughs> members of the public who would like to come forward, I'll call on you after, please. I'll just ask for I guess I don't see a list. Uh, so you've, I think you've spoken before our, our rules here. I'm going to get the bailiff to read the rules of the quorum for you. Um, but you know, then you hear the beeps and you hear that second series of beeps, you'll just finish your thought. Go ahead and please read the rules of the forum. All commissioners, court attendees are hereby advised that this meeting is conducted in accordance with provisions of the Dallas County Code, section 74 71. <coughs> Visitors and registered speakers are to preserve order in the quorum at all times. Personal, profane, or slanderous remarks are not appropriate and will not be allowed at any time during this public meeting. <coughs> Any and all applause to be kept brief in observance of time constraints. Disruptive visitors and or registered speakers may be removed and are subject to the penalties provided in the State of Texas Penal Code sections 38.13, 42.01, and 42.05. Registered individual speakers are limited to a maximum of three minutes and a maximum discussion on any one topic is limited to 30 minutes. Please, please go ahead and please state your name. Is there My name is Cameron Renee Curry. I live at 10651 Stephenton in Dallas. Thanks. Um, and this is not my first time to speak here. I spoke on a non discrimination event. Uh, uh, about a year ago, I had, to, I had to give up my location as an early voting judge because of the illness. But it came to my attention that there is someone being appointed as an election day judge in an adjacent precinct who has a history of harassing voters. Now, I appreciate and I take serving as an election judge serious. And I refuse to allow anybody to intimidate my voters. And I hope this court will take in, advice, in, in consideration those who have had complaints of harassment of voters in the past not be considered to be served serving as an election judge in the future. Thank you. And if I could, is, is there a name of the person that you're objecting to, or? I'd rather she say it to uh, 
You have some of your staff and you have okay. to say to, uh, yeah. to tell them that are pool of complaint. Yeah, please, please do that. If you, if you have a complaint, please lodge it. You, you know my staff. I <coughs> see them they're out there somewhere. You just uh, hit catch Shay. There's Lauren. I see Lauren. Uh, just a uh, question, and that is how can we uh, take action and, and resolve this uh, on the person? Uh, that's a good question. That's why we need to get an explanation of the person. I'm, I'm, I'm told that complaints have been filed on this person in the past. Well, I had a case of what is it? She submitted a list to us. We get that list from the Democratic and Republican headquarters. Right. And that should have been vetted through the process, and they would have made it to the list. Ms. Tiffany School. Thank you. That's absolutely correct. Any uh, complaints or turn into our Citizen Advisory Committee, right. the Advisory Committee takes uh, issues up, and they make recommendations, and the parties are also there. So when they, they should take those under consideration when they were making their appointments to the list. Right. Okay, and are there baseline um, rules or requirements for people to be on the, the to be in a relationship? Absolutely, and we have those in the, in the court orders today, the guidelines that everyone should be taking a look at. So those guidelines are set in, into, into place, and um, both parties realize what the, the guidelines are, and they make those decisions. Yes. And this agenda of Ms. Pippins Paul uh, also has the updated this from both parties, like Commissioner Control. Absolutely. And as far as a from uh, Friday. Correct. And another thing that I just want to be sure, complaints that we're getting, and I just got another complaint, you know, uh, similar to Ms. Kerr's complaint uh, this morning. We can send them to you and, and the party as well. Absolutely. And it can be changed. Correct. Absolutely. And that's exactly what the judge wanted to ask. Right. That is, and we will that's make, correct. That is exactly <laughs> and we will continue to make uh, changes up until 20 days before the election. Correct. So location as well as individuals, judges, and all. Yes. So and this process is not new. This, this is, is not new. new. Right. right. That's absolutely correct. Okay. And so, if, if, as far as we know today, both of us from the Republican and the Democrats have been vetted, and these people uh, on the list. Um, have agreed and are qualified as far as we know today to serve in these capacities. Absolutely. Well, I don't want to call the name, but you want to say. Okay, yeah, so that's how No, that's how you're saying. Yeah, I mean, any so complaint, if, we get that if you just forward those complaints to us, we will, we will take it through the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the necessary process. And I, I have forwarded this list um, to, to our party and have heard no complaints. Yeah, we have another item in the, in the agenda, Mr. Uh, Pickens, while we were there, about the desk uh, for the Elections Department, the desk program. We have this. And, you know, I'm glad it's there, and hopefully it will help us as well. And absolutely. We hope that really will help us for the November election. Can you explain a little bit more just for the record? You know, what is it? Well, this, this help desk is the automated uh, process in which that anyone in the elections department, all of our phone banks, we have the same access to the same information and instructions to give to anyone that calls in. Um, if anyone that's, that's typically brand new, it's just a step-by-step uh, a -step process for you to answer those questions. And it's right there, it's online, it's a uh, web-based, it has all of our forms, it's just, it takes away the paper that you can have it right there at your uh, fingertips to answer any questions about uh, uh, any election process, any questions, any voter records, um, and it's assistance to the judges. So if the judges call in, we can instantly answer their questions. Anybody can in our department. We're hoping to uh, spread this uh, to other offices in the county when uh, your constituents call you and there's information that you would need, you would have this at your your uh, uh, at your desk and have easy access to that information as well. With, with regards to information, <clears throat> has your office been, been confronted with what I call misinformation between what is out in 
what I call the Google universe, and I'm just using Google, that's what everybody seems to be. Uh, the Google universe and what's really happening with regards to our laws in this state? Uh, yes, so this will actually help them too in giving out good, credible information. There's a lot of mis There's a lot of misnomer out there. Misinformation out there. They're calling and uh, we're, we're referring them because they're saying, you know, the information is unbelievable. They go out and build and I'm using Google oh, the, information. Well, there's a lot of text. They send these texts out to all different addresses and, and when people are calling us about uh, procedure. So we want to make sure when we when we rev up in November with 20 or 30 temps in our office, they have the same accessible information as our full-time people. <coughs> we get that correct information out. So we're proud to have this. One step at a time. Right. And look forward to our new website coming out too, both in English and in Spanish. So. And are there any other public speakers regarding the appointment of election judges? Any, any other public speakers? Any other public speakers here? None. Um, um, we have a, a, a motion and a second on court orders. Uh, 10 238 a one uh, 13 238 a one may 2 uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, show, show me a and I one. Uh, the commissioner's court is now reconvened uh, in public session and recess for its briefing session for <coughs> items to be considered for a subsequent session. Mr. Martin, please take us through that. Okay. Yes, yeah, my friend, the Dr. Garcia, is the law on first item to be received. Thank you, Mr. Martin. 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 Thank you, Mr. Martin
And then I, I, I want to break out for just a quick minute and also recognize Shay Cathy from the judges' staff. She was our initial coordinator and very, very helpful in getting things going and starting for us. Uh, Dr. Garcia is our, our, our chair, and Dr. Noyce has, has stepped up to the plate to help us with vice chair. And many of you guys know Dwayne Steele, who's our, our CJAP coordinator and kind of go-to guy for all of our planning and, and information efforts. Uh, membership is broad and, and throughout the county. I, I, I recognize some folks who are here today that, that are very active in that. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith from the Jubal side, they've been very good partners and very active in this, and we'll talk a little bit about some of their initiatives that are, that are going. Uh, we have uh, Lincoln Monroe and Elise Lindbergh from the District Attorney's Office. They've been very, very instrumental and very good partners with us, and we appreciate all of their work and effort. Uh, Lynn Richardson, our Chief Public Defender, also uh, critical of what we're doing and in the middle of this, and, and has been wonderful partners with us. So we appreciate that. Uh, Going to go through it. Your packet has this in it, but I want to talk a minute about the committees. And, and Mr. Cantrell, you can kind of help me out with this. We we really went into this trying to leverage existing <coughs> committees wherever we could. You don't want to start a whole bunch of new meetings or new things without you know leveraging what you've got. And that's really what what, what was driving us on this. Uh, we've got several committees that are working and, and, and very active. And we'll kind of go through and highlight for you some of the things that have been accomplished. Now, now the first, the, the, we took as our corrections committee, the, the jail population committee, and it really ties in with the sanitation committee that, that Commissioner Price with heavy, heavy leadership from the Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Valdez have done. Now, these are their accomplishments, their work. I mean, the folks on the ground have made these things happen. But what CJAB does is gives us a nice opportunity to keep our partners around the county in the loop. So they know what's going on, what kind of accomplishments we've had, and what our challenges are. And there have been times where we've called on them to help us out. If things are in a bind, we may call our law enforcement partners and say, hey, if, if you were going to do a big warrant sweep, maybe it's best not to do it this weekend, but wait a couple of weeks. And kind of coordinate those things. It, 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 it makes a huge, huge it, it, it's, 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 it's managing. And, and we've talked before, but we can never lose highlight how major it is. This, 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 this three times past the, 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 the inspections. And, and that, that's just huge. It makes things so much easier and so much better. Uh, you know, at the core of this is this, this, this daily management of the jail population. And it is a team effort. You know, it's working with the sheriff, it's working with the DA working with the courts, keeping things moving. And, and you know, we, we, we've had some successes there. It, it's a constant challenge, but if you look about two years ago, we were running close to 68, 6,900 in jail. We've done a much better job of staying around the 6,200. We, we still want to be closer to the six, but I, I don't think you can look past that accomplishment that we've got some stability there. And, and when you start talking these numbers, <coughs> You're talking a lot of money. You're talking about 40000 a day you start saving in jail days. Our partnership with both uh, uh, Dr. Noyes and his group at CFCD and with parole is valuable for this. Uh, you know, CFCD is at the core, and the Commissioner points this out so many times. We talk about the 6,200 6, we've got in jail, and then the probably 10 times that amount out in the community. So, you know, it's, it's a huge issue, and <coughs> managing that flow of people in and out of programs, uh, uh, again, by, by CSC Dick working with us and kind of knowing where our uh, uh, high points of the year are, they're able to step in, move folks to other counties, and be very good partners. Parole. Well, I, just, I do want to say, you said CSD, CSCD and parole legislation. We talk about uh, CSCD and the management of 58,000 individuals on a daily basis. Parole has just coming back into Dallas County on an average every every month. We have approximately 500 individuals that return to Dallas County every month in addition to what's already here. And that's ongoing. And so they, they do a considerable job in, in managing. 
Uh, the uh, original director, uh, Ms. Dickerson, Jacqueline Dickerson, is a, is a wonderful partner. We're in constant contact with her and the staff. And, and actually, they're, they're reaching some kind of historic lows on their numbers in jail waiting for parole holds. Uh, they, they've been wonderful partners. And when we get in the bind again, we put out the call and, and you know, they'll work and all of a sudden be able to help us out with 20 or 30 people. And, and it's, it's just been a wonderful partnership. The next, uh, I think one of our most effective and, and, and active committees has been our law enforcement committee. Chief Mitch Bates out of Garland really took the lead on that. Uh, uh, now Chief Spivey from Richardson has taken over. Uh, one very concrete thing that came out of this was an MOU amongst our other law enforcement partners to share the cost of transporting folks from the local jails into our jail. We really were the only place in the county doing that at our full expense. We worked on this a while. It just didn't happen overnight. <coughs> we got everybody to sit down and see how, how much more effective it is to pool their money together. So this has had a, a, a positive impact. We, we just had a meeting last week and got continued to get rape reviews from the police agencies for time. Uh, uh, pickups are timely and, and go on without a hitch. It's, it's been a very, very good thing. Um, another thing that is kind of one of those not, not so concrete but makes all the difference, the sheriff has, has just been wonderful about her partnership with the law enforcement agencies and makes those meetings on the rare occasion she can, one of her top chiefs are there, and just having access to that to talk through issues cuts a lot of problems off in the past. I know there's been a time or two one particular uh, a police chief out there kind of comes in ready to be upset about something, but having the sheriff there to work through it, talk through it, realize we're all on the same page, just makes a, a, a huge difference. That committee has also worked very well with us on our <coughs> Fair Defense Act compliance by using video equipment to help with the video arrangements. That requires a, a, a lot of continued work with us, very helpful. We also built off of our existing uh, uh, pre-trial and jail diversion groups. Uh, uh, Judge Wade has recently taken over the chairmanship of that and called our Behavioral Health Steering Committee. Uh, and it looks at different options for jail diversion. A couple of things that are real highlights we point out is our bond supervision and alternative sentencing program. This is the use of monitors to get folks out of jail. And again, <coughs> having access to those law enforcement agencies were critical. Because we were able to kind of bring them in as we plan these, these programs out. Because law enforcement can have a bit of an idea of, okay, y'all are just letting everybody out. What's going on here? You're just letting everybody out. But when we were able to show them the level of supervision within these programs, uh, uh, the support the judges had, the DAs were instrumental in helping us with that. Our police chief partners know what we're at, what we're doing and feel comfortable with that. So that's, that's been very, very helpful. With on the mental health side, a, a, another one that is so critical has been our outpatient competency. This takes any, any day about 50 folks out of the jail who would be there waiting to go to the state hospital. Uh, tremendous savings. Of course, at the core of this is <coughs> staff on, on my end, but on, on, on Lynn Richardson's end. I mean, she's got the attorneys and, and, and they're working this all the time. DA has dedicated attorneys to help. These are some of our highest need individuals that we're now able to treat in the community instead of having to go to the state hospital. You get much better outcomes and folks are much more engaged in their treatment. Uh, state jail felony unit, uh, we started that a, a, a little over a year ago. Uh, our big focus there were on the waivers. Anytime you can get a waiver, it cuts about 10 jail deaths out. It may not sound like a lot, but 10 of the 10 are 100, and 10 more are 1,000, and then that, that, that starts adding up. Uh, what we were able to do was take and, and, and get some dedicated resources for the DA, five ADAs, and a couple of investigators that focus on the, the state jails. Uh, been a big help to us. Not only in moving the state jails, but it lets the folks in the courts focus on the other cases. Mr. Stretcher did give me a chest. Yes. I did it. Water. 
I, I want to say in regards to that state, Dr. Jalian and to Mr. Watkins and especially the current person, Mr. Monroe, and Mr. Flitter, in regards to those bills, you made that happen. We're in the process right now, the cause of getting committee work, uh, we're in the process of redoing the eighth floor, and along with uh, CSCD, uh, Mr. Martin and I saw what their needs were, we went and we were able to tour and review and get them some of that video equipment, uh, which we've also offered to parole, uh, which again has made a major difference with regards to the whole um, staff impact. But I, I just want to say to, uh, to uh, Mr. Monroe and Mr. Hibbert, thank you very much that you did what you said you were going to do. It's on hold somewhat, which may have some impact on our numbers right now until we get the eighth floor uh, completely done. And to John Clark, wherever he is, uh, that seems to be on cue uh, with regards to uh, finishing out that eighth floor. Well, more importantly, you know, it's, it continues to give the results that we want. And it couldn't happen, you know, without everybody coming to the table and work together on this. Because it was something that had been tried many times before, and it had not happened until, you know, CETA at the Commission's Court and the District Attorney's Office got Thank you. Uh, also, uh, uh, we, we, we have going an, an image of defense screening pilot. Uh, uh, this is done out of Mr. Warren's uh, office, and, and his folks have stepped up and taken ownership of that. We've got pilot court where we're screening defendants for uh, whether or not they're, they're really eligible for an attorney, if they, they really are indigent. Uh, and so we're getting some good results, and we'll very soon be coming back to, to the commissioners to talk about kind of institutionalizing and expanding that program. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask you just on that particular subject, are we looking for criteria to define those who are indigents that everyone agrees on? So that <coughs> what we're using out of the pilot core right now is 125% of the federal poverty level. We, we find whether you do 125 or 150 or 200 doesn't make a huge difference. The, the key is interacting with folks and making them go through their situation. Because without that, folks will take their request for an indigent appointment and ask for your income. Well, they're like, no, oh, no income. Well, you know, they start asking the questions. Well, no income, you know, who pays your rent? And, oh, well, oh, your, your wife works and has income, okay. And you get to that to determine whether or not somebody can, can really afford to pay for it. So I really was, was not asking for the percent of poverty. I was asking for the uh, questions that were asked in order to determine the income and if that is proven effective. Our initial results, a little less than 20% who say, I would like an attorney, really are eligible for one. So we, we are seeing some savings there. I think it's just a case of going through, if you put no income, you know, explore what is your living situation. How long are you doing that? Okay. Uh, Judge Burns uh, really acts as a liaison between the courts and, and the system for us. Uh, he's invaluable when we run into little bumps in the road. And, and you know, we'll be able to sit up and say, hey, we're having this issue, come on and help us out. And he kind of helps us na navigate the, the waters with the judges and with a huge help. I would say that the support that CJAP gives the courts are around the various specialty courts. You hear us talk about those a lot, but whether it's DWI or our drug courts or our reentry courts, really able to help ensure that they have the resources to be there. Christina Belton Crane, uh, many of you may know uh, uh, Christina from, uh, uh, I know her father was a long-term uh, official with us here, and she's really taken the, the kind of bull by the horn, so to speak, on reentry and helping us get that moving along. I know we have a wonderful partnership with City of Dallas Program, <coughs> my mom focuses on, on reentry for pregnant women and, and women who have children with substance abuse. Issues. Uh, uh, we're working on the same thing that will focus on our Wilmer Treatment Center. Uh, I know, I think some of you were involved in the TDCJ Parole Job Fair. 
And <coughs> the folks that had run the Wayback House for so long, you know, sold that contract, I guess, over about a year ago. And they're now focusing on reentry. And, and took some of their extra funding from when they uh, uh, novated over that contract. They were doing some really nice things uh, uh, in a real low-key manner that we're trying to integrate more. They're doing some resources, some one-on-one -on -one training, and beginning to deal and develop relationships with employers. That's a real pleasure. Council person also. I can't say enough. She she directs us on our legislative issues. Uh, I, I'm going to let her say a little bit about that. But we had some successes last session and are already working on things for the next one. Well, thank you, Ron, and uh, thank you, commissioners, for giving me the opportunity. It's been a pleasure certainly serving on this uh, County Justice Advisory Board. And thank you, Commissioner Garcia, for that appointment where I represent the city of Dallas on the Justice Advisory Board. So Dr. Garcia, as she said earlier, has worked very hard uh, to stay abreast and in front of issues important to the county based on what you see in our CJAB meetings. Uh, the Legislative Committee, which I chair, has put forth a good package for the next legislative session. Uh, we worked diligently on this throughout the month of June, uh, and so I'm going to let Ron go through it. But again, thank you for the opportunity to serve the county as a chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership with Andrew. We really had three things we worked on last, last session that we were pleased with. We've got some enhanced penalties for ATM thefts, which has been a real issue. Enhanced penalties for metal thefts. And we blew more some of the, the folks who are in jail just on a technical violation of their parole. And we, we've tried various things to either make it where we can bond those folks out. Uh, we, we've never really gotten very far. In this last session, we, we did get it changed to give parole the ability to pull in on summons as opposed to a warrant executed by a law enforcement officer so that they would summon them to their office to, to do their little, you know, their work and, and, and hearings on whether or not they were going to revoke their parole. And, and, and that's helped us with, with, with some keeping some folks out, out of the jail. Uh, we're already underway for the next session. We've already got a, a bunch of stuff out. We've been working very closely with Craig Pardue and as he puts together the package work, you will see some things that are joined from the, from the city. Uh, a, a, a very positive resource for us is Lieutenant Gary Till, who's been the, the city's and police department's legislative liaison. And, and between he and Craig, you can get just about anything done you need to. Uh, Judge Sider, uh, 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 Justice of the Peace, has really taken the lead with that group. Uh, I think really he was out front of, of highlighting for many of us some concerns we had with Senate Bill 469 around fee requirements and collections for the toll authority that led to uh, an MOU with all the counties and some due processes. He also has helped us with getting an exemption to Office of Court Administration requirements and in the rollout of their new case management system. And they started a, a, a dark community court so that folks, especially that are homeless, could, could do some public service to get out and pay off their, their tickets. So that's worked out very nicely. Dr. Smith has had a, a, a lot of things going on and, and very innovative. I, I think the one thing we've talked some about that we both all been very pleased about work. It's the burning folks, mental health court, uh, the team court, the DMC court, things we've talked about before. And, and, and she's really done a nice job of helping the law enforcement agencies to understand these programs and how they tie in. Then, the biggie, we talked about this before, was our, our DPS reporting. And, you know, we, we, we've gotten the adults up over the 90%. When, when we started, the June goal was, was kind of on the low end of things, in very short order, they took ownership of this, have gotten their issues fixed, and they're like at 99% now. And, 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 oh, it's just absolutely incredible. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Especially from the manual side. You know, everything, oh, yeah. you know, but everything we do at the juvenile department under leadership has been in the 99. There you go, I agree. Everything's 99. I agree. The reason we haven't we got to the <coughs> That's my favorite, that's my favorite scene. <laughs>
And even more important, in, in fixing these, we kind of realized and got to the point of one of our core problems, and that are at large arrests and field releases out in the outline area. So we were able to talk at our last CJAP meeting about some of the challenges there and how the law enforcement agencies can help us with that. Bob, is there anything you wanted to add? Thank you. I, I just wanted to add that we could have done tonight and I present about a lot of cooperation. So we're very appreciative of the district attorney's office and the county clerk's office. A lot of people just kind of, uh, the public defenders, just kind of pulled together in the meeting. So we're appreciative of that. We're, and we're also very appreciative of Commissioner Garcia and Dr. Jones for helping us out on our um, committee, our subcommittee that helps with reentry is one of the things we're working on for our kids who are crossing over from 17 and have no place to go. So we've, we've been very, very fortunate that it's a wonderful collaboration. We don't have success without having great partners around us. So we're very appreciative of that. And I'll tell you a quick specific kudos to Dwayne Steele, who did a lot Absolutely. of the apologies. Well, I appreciate it. When you start thanking some people, you always forget something. So my apologies for that. But uh, a recent retiree who really drove that piece for us on Ms. Elba Chat. She recently had to retire uh, healthy. But uh, she she took it, she took that little mother on and she she drove us to She she really did. She really did. That's a good person that I've known from both sides of the aisle. He was a probation officer down in Ellis County when I was a young man. So, uh, oh. 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 she might have some information to me. I thought about that. I wish her, you know, it's sincerely, you know, you know she's on the prayer list, and I wish her the very best in you know, what she's going to do in our responsibility. I think all of us who know Elvin have worked with her for years and years uh, feel the same way. Uh, uh, a very sad situation. We wish her the best. Okay, uh, this is probably the biggie <laughs> that we've put a, a lot of time, effort, and energy into, and a, a, a lot of work. And, and I know that continues to be a, an area of interest, uh, and we continue to see information come out about that. Uh, you haven't read the, the report of the task force and, and you're having you know trouble sleeping or something, I'd encourage you to get it out and read all 57 pages. <laughs> It'll probably put you right out. Uh, I, I, I think I would summarize this, and Doctor, you can help me if I'm wrong. This is a very complex issue to try to get your hands around. You're talking things that have operated in a certain way for years and years and years. I think the need for better information systems that we're all aware of and working on really highlighted things here. And I think the other challenge is, you know, at the end of the day, you got to remember the criminal courts, there's 30 different ones, 17 felony and 13 misdemeanors, and can do things as they please. And, and so it's been a challenge getting that all together. But what has come out of that is, uh, you know, we have created a, a bond forfeiture unit with two district attorneys and, and two clerks. Uh, those two attorneys have gotten up to speed very, very quickly. They're already out there. They're making hearings. We're seeing the amount collected go up, the amount of judgments go up. Uh, uh, they're really getting their hands around that. And, and, and so we're very pleased with where that's headed. Uh, we have done a better job of standard, standardizing our processes uh, across the courts. Uh, IT, Mark Crook specifically, helped us with a, a special database that just made all the difference on reporting. Uh, this continues to be a work in progress. Uh, again, the bail bonds are a, uh, they're, they're a complex entity. And we have focused this from keeping in mind that the whole point of a bail bond is to get somebody back into jail. And that we want to make sure we lose, we don't lose sight of that as we move forward. Now you have to have forfeitures at the back end of that to make the bond meaningful. But the goal of a bail bond is to ensure you got somebody in your hands so you process them. Through. Quicker you process somebody through the court, quicker you move on to stop spending money on them. So we'll have more to come on that. This is we're spending a lot of time, effort, and energy on this. Uh, a complex issue, but we're making some positive changes. Dr. Garcia, thank you for your effort 
on this for the collaboration that you bring to this group. Also, for all the work you've done with the deadlines, I know it's so there's something in the paper, you know, that's responsive and said, come talk to me, I'll explain that, and I'll be very proactive. Thank you. Just like Mr. Scripture said, it's a group of people, you know, from all <coughs> different departments are still working together. We still um, have, you know, some more meetings that we're going to have to, you know, we're really working with, with this until, in my opinion, we all feel that we have solved this issue for us. I mean, I can do it in this structure. Uh, okay. Well, let, let me follow up, Ron, because uh, then Councilwoman, Garcia was chair of our legislative committee and just transitioned out even when she got elected commissioner. She enthusiastically took the chair position of a committee that took a lot of time and effort and coordination. And you know, sometimes you don't find people that are that excited about getting into something where you have to work on a lot. And uh, so we appreciate that and your leadership and direction on the committee has certainly developed it into what it should be. And we needed it to do it. So I just want to say thank you for that because you've done an incredible job. And thank you. Thank you. Like I said, it, it cannot be done without a vertical. So thank you to all the members of the committee. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll second that motion. <laughs> yeah, I third, I third that motion. <laughs> no, just close with two things we're really focusing on is it, continuing work on our compliance with Senate Bill 7, which is the Fair Defense Act and some of the challenges there. <laughs> But then we're really working and very close to rolling out the services for what we call serial inebriates. These are folks that are getting picked up on public in talks. We're talking like 70 and 80 times in a two-year period, trying to fold them into some services. It's, uh, again, another partnership with the City of Dallas and, and Parkland. Uh, Dr. Pepe's very involved in this. So you'll be hearing more about that. We just wanted to highlight it. Last thing I want to say is that the purpose of committee work is to make identifications in terms of how you can compress and manage resources better. And regardless of what committee it is, what we do with the data is that we're able to <coughs> churn it in such a way that we're able to see who the top 50, top 200 uh, frequent flyers, as far as colloquialism, are. And as a result, target those individuals. I know we've done that in Diego. We've done, we've done it in every, almost every committee. And I see this committee uh, being no different, whether it's Cyril or Liberals or whatever. And so uh, I just want to say thank you because it's at the end of the day, you know, we say this in all, most of our committee meetings, it's how we manage our resources or our resources will manage us. And it's taking that information and data that you get and, and keeping in mind that your end goal isn't a report or data. Your end goal is how do you use that to influence policy decisions and, and to make things work. Right. And colleagues, uh, to close out very quickly, I just want to thank Mr. Ron Stretcher and Mr. Steele. You know, I, uh, I give everybody that is here from the University of Michigan a big round of applause. Yeah. Yeah.
Item 6, Public Works, recommends accepting a purchase office offer from Next Box 3 LLC for vacant foreclosed properties at 341 and 351 East 3rd Street in Lancaster and authorized tax assessor collector to disperse proceeds in accordance with the property tax code. Item 7, Budget 7, any of the county's travel training requests. 7B, recommends approval for temporary funding of the Clean Air Task Force from Rose Ridge 1 through December 31, 2012. Item 7C, recommends approval of the District Attorney Office of Reorganization and refer to HR Civil Service for proper classification of the declassified and new positions. Item 7D, recommends approval of the District Clerk's 2013 archive plan. And item E, recommends approval of the County Clerk's 2013 archive plan. And Judge and Commissioner, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Brown for your fiscal year 2013 budget update. Contributed for 2011. 
um, for the views of Maine Unknown Causes, it assists the juvenile individuals through the court system. There's a payment for the public service program. We needed to do that to ensure that the facilities in the juvenile department are adequately painted. We've been spending a, a large amount of time out there, this whole lot of them be a dedicated individual. There's funding for the new WMBE system. I don't know exactly how much that system is going to be, but I did put $50,000 in there. I've talked with Lefty, and she feels that will be adequate, so as we move forward with what that system will be, that will be funding for that set of that. And then there's the funding set aside in the Shared Human Resources Division. I'm doing a review of their staffing. They recently were able to hire all their needs, so they use a lot of detached staff to get there. So we're going to do a quick look at how they're staffed. We're going to work with HR, with county HR, and see how they can work together. And then there probably will be some additional staff that will be added in there on the professional HR side. Yeah, yeah. On, uh, <coughs> I have a student out in the district. Um, and I, I see Chief Sewell and Chief Lord both of um, But um, while there's been some attack as well, so it's kind of what I'm considering to be kind of policy changes over there. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how that's going to really impact, especially when we start talking about the issue of classification. Uh, but my understanding, when I look at that flow, that's where the people came from. So what's going on with the donors? And, and that's what I need to do is get, oh. get over there, sit down with them, and, and, and work it through. But I wanted to let you know that I'm not, I'm not dropping it, and I put some money aside just in case there's some cost for it. Okay. I want to commend you for the, first of all, for the district. Uh, the, the million dollars for the bridge going to the district project. This is, this is such a good life for matching money and for leveraging that money. I just, I think that's a very smart move. I'm really hopeful we'll work on the bridge. And the second thing is, I just want to give a shout out to the public service program. I had a gentleman, a constituent, call me a couple of weeks ago. He had a whole apartment load of furniture that he wanted to contribute to, to the media of the county. And the uh, public service program showed up early in a long time. And uh, we're so, did such a fine job that he called me and was commending me for it. And I commended that. But I want to thank you with the public. Good job that you did. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, is the GIS system on there? The, the GIS system actually is, I believe, briefed today. Yeah. Or is it, we're going to brief it next week. Yeah. It's a couple thousand dollars. It wasn't a significant cost. Yes, it was a couple thousand dollars. No, we primarily briefed the hardware part of this. Right. We're still reviewing the software piece that we had talked about. So we need to go through that information. Okay. And since the public works is in the major capital fund, it won't impact the general fund, so at any point in time we can push okay. the money into that. Um, traffic in the mirror yet? Or not? Traffic has not changed. It is, it is funded. And the, the assumption is, is that we'll get $2.5 million next year that we should have gotten this year, but that's all we have in there at this point in time. So if we do end up getting another agreement, I know that you're working on it in the next couple of weeks, that will end up being positive towards the 2014. Agreement. My understanding is the else is taking theirs, we're taking them on ours. That's that's why I have left it in as as of, as of right now, but we do need a camera to be the last of those agreements. Um, uh, I did I did put aside some money for the for the new traffic uh, like units. Um, that is, it has also been built in here. I apologize I didn't include it on the slide. And last, last piece is I do have some funds in it for the public defender mental health staff. Um, the public defender's office has a very large request. We won't be able to fund all of what they're asking for, but we will be able to fund some things. And so what I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks is spend some time over there and evaluate exactly what we can do. I think I've been with you spend some time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I don't know what what you're saying, but they, we don't think they need. I'm saying that the, the request that came across is approximately over a million dollars worth of staff, and I'm not sure that we can afford to put that much towards it. Um, we'll take a look at yes, There's been a lot of positions to us. And so before I was going to move forward on that, I wanted to spend some time actually taking a look at what's currently there and what, what we can accomplish with additional staff. Okay. Yeah. It was larger than I expected. Yeah. The 
last thing is there's, there's also a public defender capital murder group that we're looking at. I'm still fully not trying to determine what our actual costs are that would go away if we created the group. So I added a little bit of funding in there to cover that. The reality of that one is, is we'll probably end up double billing a little bit because you still have cases that are already in the pipeline with private attorneys. You're going to still tell them even when the new ones come on. But down the road, I anticipate that this could be between two and three hundred thousand dollars savings. Well, so, and is it also bring about uh, more interest in joining our public defender pool and a, on the second chair piece an opportunity for the for them to serve the second chairs? Um, to me, it, to me, there's two different things that I really liked about this. One is the fact that there was, I think there will be a savings. I really do believe that we will end up with a plan that has a savings. And two is that I had all the district judges sign off and said they would use it. And so it's unique to get any, you know, that group in a totality to agree to something. And so if I want to make sure that, you know, that to reward them for agreeing to do that. But we did, I did want to do a little bit more due diligence on it. Well, it has an opportunity to build a specialist to get the best defense possible, bring in this, on the second chair piece these highly uh, experienced comparative to the pool um, public defenders and, and get them ready you know, to do that. The, the, the way the plan... And, and to drive talent to it so right. everywhere else. This plan also changed a little bit from what I originally saw to where it is today. Because where it is today, it's actually two high-level attorneys that would be doing the prosecution, plus an attorney for the appeals, an investigator, and a court. And so that's part of the reason it slowed up a little bit in my office, is because the cost got larger, and I now need to confirm that it was going to actually be a savings. Um, I agree with the format of you need two people sitting there, two, two high-paid chairs, and you need the person who can be there the whole time for the appeals process. So I agree with the concept. I just need to make sure we're actually going to be able to do it yeah, given what we've seen with the innocent project, it's absolutely essential that people who are, that their lives are at risk for having the absolute best defense possible. And Ms. Richardson, if it would be possible to rotate in also our experienced public defenders on the, on the team so that they get that experience? Absolutely, Judge. Um, it's also a cost savings to the county because on those cases, you have to appoint sometimes two and three attorneys. So you have two high-level um, public defenders that would be handling that, and then the attorneys in the court would also assist. We've actually been doing some of it already in Dallas County. When you have private lawyers that are doing the um, death cases, we allow our public defenders to sit in on the second or third chair so that the county doesn't have to pay for an additional court-appointed attorney. So it would be a continuation, and they continue to train young lawyers who would take over when the others transition out. The cost that would be promising, but also <clears throat> the best defense possible when human life is at stake. You know, I think that's important. To Absolutely. I, I, I still can't get over the young woman.
Mr. Rand and Mr. Rand, gosh, our numbers have to get better. So we're only going to do it by putting the staff and um, you know, resources in place. That's right. right. One step at a time, I'm delighted. 17 percent is not acceptable, and we're going to tackle that. Thank you. Where are we on, on that? Well, you know, I like to talk with you about that. It's going to be very expensive. And, and, you know, I've had some conversations with, uh, with Alberta Blair about funding it, uh, finding resources to fund it. Uh, and we're talking with attorneys that work that with Gordon and um, some outside attorneys who do this kind of work. And the problem is that this court, and I'll bring it forward to you, is going to have to agree if you want to do that to, to fund it. Not yeah, you know, no, and we, we, Judge, and I know you, you may or may not have had access to that information before, but let me just tell you, uh, and we've gone down that road, but when you talk about disparity, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars, and especially if you try to go it along, even other people who have done disparity studies, they've done it in collaboration with other jurisdictions. I'm going to try to gather collaboration with other entities. I understand, but, but the data, you know, and the aggressiveness is the work going to be on this court and, and, and its policy because the data doesn't change that drastically. You know, between what NGTA did, who they did it, I think they did it with two or three other entities. Right. Uh, and so, I mean, airport, yeah, the airport, dark, I mean, they, they all start spending yeah. millions of dollars. Uh -huh. The, the problem is I think we all we all purchase from the same pool. So hopefully if we can meet with some of the folks who do this kind of work and share some of the other plans. Maybe they can do something in terms of reducing our cost to get something done. And we'll we'll have those conversations with some of those organizations. I think our first step is we're working with Ms. Crawford right. and uh, putting the staff. Right. You know, because that's another issue that right. has to happen. So that's our first step. Right. Exactly. We're working on the disparity. We will continue to see what is out there available. I know that I have some as well. So, but okay. the, the technology system will help with right now. Right now, you know, we're doing everything manually, yeah. collecting the data is manual. So this will help. Yeah. So thank you for that. Before we go on, did you want trucks make the list? Yeah, let's do the trucks. You did make the list.
since that point in time, the tax values have gone down, but we haven't really <coughs> decreased our IT staff. In, in, in actuality, we've increased our IT costs. And so right now, we are, the tax rate that's there is not adequate to cover all the costs. So what's happening is you're then using some of the tax rates for projects to cover your operations in order to make sure, make sure that we insulate the half cent for projects. The easiest way is to move the IT staffing and operations back into the general fund, and that way there's always a half cent of the tax rate available for projects. So it's just decoupling again. I, I, at the time said I would ensure that it didn't impact us, and then I was wrong. Judge, I think we can bring the agenda. You still have one speaker less than this is if you have no questions on information on this. Okay. So remember, we've had the uh, rules of the forum read from speakers. You would like to come forward and uh, give your remarks. I've been an election judge for 16 years now, and this is the packet that we get handed out at our training session, and I'd like for Commissioner Cantrell to go through and see where we can get some paper savings there. I mean, it's the new people look at it and kind of feel overwhelmed, but with every single training, we get this inch of paper, and I started putting it back in my supply box to send it back. But there's got to be some savings here. Also, I would like you to consider a uh, contract with Bruce Sherbet for consulting for the November election. I see you smiling. But let me tell you, we've had four elections this year and four glitches. My first election was State Council School Board. And I was delivered an M100 machine, the great machine you put your paper ballots in. It wouldn't print out the beginning report even. I called the warehouse twice. Both times they promised to send people and didn't. Third time I called Tony Pickle, and she sent Charles out, and I finally got it fixed. But voters are not happy when they put them in a little slot and they don't see their ballot uh, being counted by the machine. The second election was our primaries. Now, Democrats and Republicans uh, in these precincts were at the same place. The Democrats had no pens to sign the voters in. I mean, so we shared, got through that. The next one was the runoff for city council and school board races. I had a laptop that wouldn't work, wouldn't open. And later in the day, then, someone came and, and worked on it. And now these were not just particular to my precinct or the precincts I was covering. This was going on through a lot of those uh, precincts in Irving anyway. And then our fourth election was the primary uh, runoffs. And I had posted, I had seven precincts, I posted 854 early votes. An hour after the polls opened, here came somebody from the county with 104 additional early votes for me to post. I've got voters lined up here wanting to vote and get on to work. And here is this list with 104 more. If I had had that list Saturday, Sunday, or Monday after early voting closed, I could have had that done before the polls opened. But we know that the Department of Justice is sending observers out for the November election. I don't want any glitches in November. Whatever, you know, needs to be done needs to be addressed. And, you know, first 15 years I did this, there were no problems. The last year there are. It may be a bigger job than one person can fix. But I don't want GOJ to come back, especially in Irving, but even in Dallas County, and say there's funny stuff going on. Thank you. Um, all right, that, that's going to take us to a uh, closed session. Um, I'd like to get in there and get, get that done quickly, and then there'll be opportunities for anyone who wants to either visit the press or and come back at 11 for our, our part in uh, a public hearing.
brief agenda today for closed session. Uh, this court's now reconvened in public session. The recess for its closed session is authorized by Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code. Thank you. 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 Thank you.